അവരുടെ ഒരു മേജർ കംപ്ലൈന്റ് എന്താണെന്ന് വെച്ചാൽ റിക്കറൻറ്റ് അബ്ഡമിനൽ പെയിൻ ആണ് സോ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് എ മേജർ പ്രൊപ്പോർഷൻ ഓഫ് പീരിയാഡിക് കേസസ് അറ്റൻഡിങ് അവർ പി എച്ച് സീസ് പ്രസൻറ്റ് വിത്ത് ഹിസ്റ്ററി ഓഫ് റിക്കറൻറ്റ് അബ്ഡമിനൽ പെയിൻ ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് എ റിയൽ കൺസേൺ ഫോർ ദി ഹോൾ ഫാമിലി നോ ഏർലിയർ റിക്കറൻറ്റ് അബ്ഡമിനൽ പെയിൻ ദ ടേം റിക്കറൻറ്റ് അബ്ഡമിനൽ പെയിൻ വാസ് യൂസ് സിനോണിമസ്ലി വിത്ത് ഫംഗ്ഷണൽ അബ്ഡമിനൽ പെയിൻ now we have uh, different terms for long standing intermittent or constant abdominal pain in children and we will see different terminologies that are being used later in this presentation now why this is important is that chronic or intermittent or constant abdominal pain is usually seen in about 9 to 15 percentage of all children that is 1 in 10 to 15 or 1 in uh, 10 pediatric population children experience recurrent abdominal pain now covering the entire causes and treatment of recurrent abdominal pain in this session is difficult so i have put forward some objectives to be covered now by the end of this session all of us should be able to recognize the symptoms and understand the terminologies that are being used in recurrent abdominal pain identify certain red flag signs and symptoms decide which cases needs to be evaluated which cases needs referral and able to treat some common causes that we come across in our day to day practice so with that in mind let us begin now the recurrent abdominal pain is defined as abdominal pain at least 3 episodes of pain over at least 3 months that interfered with function this used to be this was an earlier definition for recurrent abdominal pain now we have certain terminologies other terminologies that are being used in uh, long lasting intermittent pain in children that is because even though recurrent abdominal pain is most often considered functional or non organic abdominal pain in 5 to 10 percentage of cases an organic cause can be found so newer terminologies are being introduced to throw some clarity on this these include these are uh, mainly chronic abdominal pain that is long lasting intermittent or constant abdominal pain that is functional or organic so both functional and organic causes are clubbed under chronic abdominal pain then non organic abdominal pain or functional abdominal pain which is the commonest cause of recurrent abdominal pain these are pain without any evidence of anatomic inflammatory metabolic or neoplastic abnormalities and there are certain functional gastrointestinal disorders these are group of gastrointestinal disorders that include variable combinations of chronic or recurrent gi symptoms which are not explained by structural or biochemical abnormalities so we have recurrent abdominal pain that is now being defined as chronic abdominal pain that includes both functional and organic uh, causes and functional is the most common one and functional abdominal pain or non organic abdominal pain are pain without any evidence of any anatomic inflammatory metabolic or neoplastic abnormalities now these functional gastrointestinal disorders are further classified as according to rom 3 criteria this include h1 that includes mainly vomiting and aerophagia uh, these are adolescent rumination syndrome cyclical vomiting syndrome and aerophagia mostly concerned with vomiting h1 in cyclic vomiting syndrome there is intense episodic attacks of nausea and vomiting that can last about 1 hour to about 10 days and it includes about uh, vomiting for at least about four times per hour and these are intense episodes this h1 classification is mainly concerned with vomiting h2 is uh, regarding abdominal pain that is functional gastrointestinal disorders uh, including abdominal pain that is h2 these are further classified to functional dyspepsia irritable bowel syndrome abdominal migraine childhood functional abdominal pain not otherwise specified and childhood functional abdominal pain syndrome in this the most common one is childhood functional abdominal pain not otherwise specified that contributes majority of the case of functional abdominal pain followed by irritable bowel syndrome and functional dyspepsia now what are the difference between these 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 uh, classification these these uh, terms functional dyspepsia these are persistent or recurrent pain or discomfort centered in the upper abdomen that is above the umbilicus and these pain are not relieved by defecation or not associated with onset recent change in stool frequency or form 
that is pain in the upper abdomen there is no relief with defecation and not associated with the recent recent change in the frequency or uh, form of the stool now all these functional ga disorders have no evidence of inflammatory anatomic metabolic or neoplastic process second is irritable bowel syndrome in irritable bowel syndrome there is an abdominal discomfort and but there is an improvement with defecation and there is a recent onset change in the frequency of stool and a recent onset change in the form or the appearance of the stool that is irritable bowel syndrome in functional dyspepsia there is no change in change with defecation and there is no recent onset change in the frequency or defecation of stool and when there is improvement with defecation and there is a recent onset change in the frequency or form of the stool it is irritable bowel syndrome third is abdominal migraine now abdominal migraine there is paroxysmal episodes of intense acute peri umbilical pain that lasts for about 1 hour and or even more and in between period child is usually healthy that may last several weeks to months pain interferes with normal activities and there may be associated other features of migraine like anorexia nausea vomiting headache photophobia pallor etc that is abdominal migraine intense pain peri umbilical pain paroxysms of pain and certain features of other features of migraine like anorexia nausea vomiting headache photophobia may be present then comes the childhood functional abdominal pain not otherwise specified these are episode episodic or continuous abdominal pain and there is insufficient criteria to meet other functional gastrointestinal disorders that we have mentioned above so all those comes under childhood functional abdominal pain and it is the major contributor towards the functional gastrointestinal disorders or functional abdominal pain in children then it is said to be functional abdominal pain syndrome when there is some daily loss of function and additional somatic symptoms such as headaches limb pain difficulty in sleeping etc is there it is called childhood functional abdominal pain syndrome so as i said childhood functional abdominal pain not otherwise specified is the most common followed by inflammatory bowel syndrome irritable bowel syndrome and functional dyspepsia so these terminologies we have to understand and uh, uh, these are the different terminologies that is used in rom 3 criteria then there is h3 that is regarding constipation incontinence and we will come across constipation later in the presentation so what causes functional gastrointestinal disorders now the term functional should not be confused that the child is not having pain or child is feigning the symptoms no the child is actually experiencing pain sometimes the pain is severe as severe as in an organic pathology but the etiology here is not well known to us so we are so classifying as functional gastrointestinal disease it is a positive diagnosis now the child uh, this uh, early it was said that certain motility disturbances were causing these functional gastrointestinal disorders now the theory is put forward are visceral hypersensitivity that is leading to abnormal bowel sensitivity to stimulus that can be a physiological stimulus a psychological stimulus or another noxious stimulus a psychosocial stress can affect pain intensity and quality that is the child's response to pain can be influenced by stress personality type and the reinforcement of illness behavior within the family then there are certain theories pointing towards abnormalities of the entric nervous system there is inflammation of the intestine and the effect of inflammatory mediators and cytokines on the entric nervous system is causing this pain and uh, another theory is that there is an altered intestinal permeability that is enabling passage of food antigens into the mucosa leading to prolonged stimulation of the intestinal mucosal immune system and entric nervous system so basically the pathophysiology is not well understood even now now how do we approach to a child who is coming to us with recurrent abdominal pain so uh, now we know that about 1 in 10 children experience recurrent abdominal pain this recurrent abdominal pain can be organic or non organic or functional abdominal pain and functional abdominal pain is the leading cause of such recurrent abdominal pain in children so we will see how about we how, how do we approach uh, when we encounter a case in our phc these functional abdominal pains are usually non specific and usually peri umbilical we have to identify certain alarming symptoms and signs which may be a clue towards an organic etiology now the presence of an alarming symptom or sign doesn't actually necessarily lead to an organic etiology and also a lack of alarming symptom does not rule out organic disease also so that we have to keep in mind now these are certain red flag symptoms that we have to look look for in a child coming with recurrent abdominal pain in later slides we will see in the context of certain organic etiologies where these symptoms and signs fit 
So I'll just go through the red flag symptoms that is given in textbooks. These include pain that wakes up the child from sleep, persistent right upper or lower quadrant pain. Then there is significant vomiting that may be bilious vomiting, protracted vomiting, cyclical vomiting. There is unexplained fever. All genitourinary tract symptoms, dysphagia, chronic severe diarrhea or nocturnal diarrhea, gastrointestinal blood loss, involuntary weight loss or failure to thrive, deceleration of linear growth, delayed puberty, and family history of inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, and peptic ulcer disease. These are the red flag symptoms that we should look forward. In the later slides, we will see certain symptoms in context to with the uh, organic pathology. Then red flag signs, these are tenderness in the abdomen, right upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, localized fullness or mass, hepatosplenomegaly, jaundice, costovertebral vertebral angle tenderness, arthritis, spinal tenderness, perianal disease, abnormal unexplained physical findings, other physical findings, hematochesia, anemia. So all these red flag signs may point towards some organic etiology. And it is said that, or, that most commonly found red flag symptoms and signs are unexplained fever, then persistent vomiting and blood in stools. So such symptoms we find we should, uh, we should investigate more for an organic etiology. Now, in clinical evaluation, we should suspect that the child may have an organic pathology affecting the gastrointestinal disorder. It may be affecting the uh, biliary system, the gallbladders, the pancreas, genitourinary system, and certain miscellaneous conditions that we should, we should remember. Now, the commonest gastrointestinal disorder that we come across in the child with recurrent pain, having an organic etiology, may be a chronic constipation. Now, in chronic constipation, it is actually uh, two... Uh, criteria for more than four weeks. That is out of this uh, six months, six criteria, two criteria for more than four weeks. That is defecation less than or equal to two per week, fecal incontinence more than one per week after acquisition of toileting skills, history of excessive stool retention, history of painful or hard bowel movements, presence of large mass in the rectum or on per abdomen examination, large, history of large diameter stools. So these uh, these are features of chronic constipation and more than 90% of chronic constipations are functional. So these, uh, we can treat these children in our OPD. Now they include dietary, they need dietary intervention such as increased fluid intake, then increased fiber content in food, behavioral interventions, including regular toilet time for about five or 10 minutes after each meal, use of stool diaries and reward system and also need uh, parental education. Drugs that we can give are mainly osmotic laxative, which are preferred in children uh, with constipation. These are polyethylene glycol, are uh, the first line that is preferred in children above one year. If there is evidence of encopresis, that is leakage of stool, as the child resists bowel movement, there may be leakage of stool, and this is called encopresis. And if, the, if there is encopresis, then the child needs disinfection. And we can start the child on polyethylene glycol at 1.5 to 2 gram per kg per day for disinfection and 0.1 to 1 gram per kg per day as maintenance. And the once uh, a child is symptom free for, uh, for about uh, 3 to 6 months, we can start tapering the dose. And alternatively, we can use lactose and other uh, diuretic and other uh, agents, for laxatives for children. And usually the dose of lactose that we use are 1 to 3 ml per kg per day. So this uh, polyethylene glycol is now the preferred agent for uh, as lax laxative in children. Now, next cause that we usually come across is parasitic infection, especially uh, parasitic infection. And it is said that GRD infection can cause recurrent abdominal pain in children. These children may present with blotting, then uh, gas, cramps, and diarrheas. And these children may require stool evaluation. That is, a stool evaluation for ova and parasite may, may uh, show parasitic infiltrations. And anti-helminthics can be used as treatment. Next comes peptic ulcer disease, acid reflux, and dyspepsia in children. These usually present with burning epigastric pain that are usually worse on awakening or before meals. And these are relieved with antacids. And if you are suspecting a peptic ulcer, child may need a esophago gastro -duodenoscope. We can start the child that is uh, on uh, antacids and histamine H2 blockers for acid reflux. And, but uh, the benefit of these has not been well studied, but we can, uh, 
we have we have been giving child antacids and H2 blockers. In dyspepsia, proton pump inhibitors, including lansoprazole and pantoprazole, these are found to be safe and effective for treatment of dyspepsia in children and adolescents. Next, inflammatory bowel disease. Now, the alarming symptom that we see in inflammatory bowel disease is mainly growth failure. There is delayed bone maturation, delayed sexual development, and there may be extra intestine manifestation, particularly in Crohn's disease, more than ulcerative colitis. These include oral aphthous ulcers, peripheral arthritis, erythema nodosum, digital clubbing, episcleritis, etc. So these children require blood investigations, endoscoping, and radiological studies, and may need referral to a pediatric gastroenterologist for anti-inflammatory medications and biologics. Then uh, other rare gastrointestinal disorders that may present as recurrent abdominal pain are celiac disease. There is failure to thrive. There is chronic diarrhea vomiting, abdominal distension, muscle wasting, anorexia, and irritability. This child may need evaluation with antibodies, HLA typing, and duodenal histology, and a gluten-free diet. Lactose intolerance, that is symptoms associated with lactose ingestion. There is also bloating, gas, cramps, and diarrhea. Then come surgical condition that we should not miss in uh, children with recurrent abdominal pain. These include Meckel's diverticulum. There may be periambilical or lower abdominal pain, there may be blood in stools. Recurrent indosusception. There is paroxysmal severe cramping abdominal pain associated with blood in stools. And this may require contrast studies and Meckel scan for uh, diagnosis. Other surgical conditions like internal, inguinal, or abdominal wall hernias. There is uh, severe abdominal wall pain. Then chronic appendicitis or appendiceal mucosal. There may be index recurrent right, right, right lower quadrant pain. And all these surgical conditions require uh, imaging with either ultrasound, a CT abdomen, or, a, or an enema, barium enema. Then gallbladder and pancreas. These are also mainly surgical conditions like cholelithiasis, 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 and recurrent pancreatitis. They may present pain with rough right upper quadrant pain, and which may worsen with meals. In cholelithiasis, there may be associated jaundice. Recurrent pancreatitis, there is a pain radiating to back associated with vomiting. And these children also require uh, ultrasound examination, CT scan, and serum amylase level uh, examinations. Genital urinary tract infection uh, pathologies causing recurrent abdominal pain, urinary tract infections. These are dull suprapubic pain. There may be associated plank pain. There may be there may be high fever. There may be vomiting. Then hydronephrosis, unilateral abdomen or plank pain, urolithiasis. There may be progressive severe pain. There is flank to inguinal region and to testicles. There is pain radiating from flank to inguinal region and testicles. And other genital urinary disorders may present as suprapubic or lower abdominal pain and with genital urinary symptoms. They require, they require urine analysis, ultrasound of the kidneys, ureter, and bladder, CT scans, and gynecological evaluations. Other rare miscellaneous conditions that can cause recurrent pains are uh, one is sickle cell crisis. There may be child may be pale on examination and hematological evaluation shows sickle cell anemia. Then other conditions like hinosol and purpura, there may be recurrent severe crampy abdominal pain, but associated with other characteristics such as species like rash, arthritis, or cool blood in stools. Angineurotic edema associated with swelling of face or airways. And sometimes even acute intermittent porphyria may present with severe pain that may be precipitated by certain drugs, fasting, or infections. So these required hematological analysis, urine analysis, and certain specific investigations. So these were a system-wise approach to cases with recurrent abdominal pain due to an organic etiology. All of these, like, uh, with, like I said, have some form of an alarm, alarming symptom or sign, which we should not miss. And if, an, if, a, if a sign or symptom point towards some of these diagnoses, a detailed investigation is necessary to establish the diagnosis. Like I said, if there is a concern concerning history or physical examination or a red flag sign or symptom as explained, then child requires further investigation. That is, if the child has fever, weight loss, back pain, neurological symptoms. Basically, child requires an, uh, a CBC and ESR or CRP as an inflammatory marker study, a urine analysis with a urine microscopy and urine culture and sometimes an ultrasound. These are the very basic investigation that we can do in our, in our peripheral uh, health centers, primary health centers, or uh, in our uh, hospitals. 
as a baseline evaluation for ruling out certain organic causes leading to recurrent abdominal pain. And if there are kidney symptoms, we can we can also go for CBC, SR, CRP, as of urine, urine cultures. Gastrointestinal symptom with a similar panel also along with ultrasound of demand and a stool or blood. Pelvic symptoms need appropriate ultrasound evaluation. Now, if the child does not have a concerning history of physical examination finding, then we can move towards a diagnosis of functional abdominal pain disorder, which is the commonest. And we have to classify them according to the ROM3 criteria, that is functional dyspepsia, which is an, which is an upper abdominal pain that does not relieve with defecation and has no recent change in the form and the frequency or the uh, form of the stool. It may be irritable bowel syndrome, functional abdominal pain not otherwise specified or abdominal migraine as per the diagnostic criteria given in ROM3. Now, how do we manage such case? The, once we make a diagnosis of functional abdominal pain and rule out an organic etiology, if there is an organic etiology, obviously we treat the cause. Now, when, once we rule out an organic etiology, the first step is to explain and reassure. That is, carefully explain to the family and the child, family, the concept and the reasoning behind all the investigation that we had done. And um, once the organic cause has been systematically ruled out with, with physical examination history and certain investigation, reassure the patient and family that no major illness is present. Now identify red flags, that is make sure that the parents fully understand objective changes and provide guidelines for what to do if they occur. Understand and tell them the red flags and ask them to look for the red flags and come to us if they identify the red flags. Now avoid psychological, psychological labeling, that is, uh, it is important to validate the child's pain, but reassure the family when there is no evidence of serious underlying pathology, that is, does not uh, mean that it is psychological, does not mean the child may be malingering. Child experiences pain. Like I said, child experiences pain, which may be as intense as in an organic etiology. So do not avoid psychological labeling. Then allow normal activity. That is, encourage normal activity between the times of pain. Not during the time of pain, between the time of the pain, encourage normal activity. Otherwise, parents uh, should, should be encouraged to avoid reinforcing recurrent abdominal pain symptoms with secondary gain, that is, uh, such as missing school or removal from routine activities. Child may use this as a tool for secondary gain. So, they should be encouraged normal activity in between times of pain. Then watch out for withdrawal, that is, identifying psycho uh, psychological factors that might worsen the symptoms, such as bullying, peer coercion, stress, anxiety, sexual, emotional, or physical abuse, or domestic violence. Now, if the child begins to withdraw from normal activity, psychological referral should be considered over escalating pain management. Now, establish a regular follow-up that this may, uh, that is explain to the parents that this may take some time and establish a regular follow-up and be available to the parents and make judicial use of second opinion. That is, be open to requests from second opinions. Sometimes uh, if, we, if we are not confident about understanding the red flags or uh, parents are anxious, then we can, uh, we can uh, uh, then they, may, they may opt for a second opinion and we can uh, help them for a second opinion also. Now, general management, um, there are several drugs and uh, that, that are tried in uh, functional abdominal pain, but most uh, effect is seen in cognitive behavioral therapy, like in several studies are saying that effect is in cognitive behavioral therapy. That is a, uh, it is a psychosocial method that focus on changing patterns of thinking that cause unwanted behaviors. Then there are certain hypnotherapies and role of probiotics and symbiotics are uh, debatable. In conjunction with supportive therapy, we have to treat acid reflux, we have to treat dyspepsia and we have to treat constipation. These are the, uh, that is constipation, acid reflux and dyspepsia may be associated, may be, may be a confounding factor, may, be, uh, may present along with this functional, functional component of the abdominal pain. So we, have, we can start supportive therapy with uh, medications. Now, if the symptoms do not improve and workup is unremarkable, as, like I said, consider a subspecialist referral. Like I said, uh, treatment for acid reflux or functional dyspepsia with uh, proton pump inhibitors, uh, pantoprazole, lansoprazole, 
treatment of con chronic constipation or constipation predominant irritable bowel syndrome with uh, adequate uh, fiber intake, diet, fluids, restriction of uh, milk and uh, other carbonated drinks and uh, junk foods and usage of laxatives like polyethylene glycol and lactose. Then diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome, there may be an effect use of uh, low parameter rifaximin. And abdominal migraines, if the criteria meets abdominal migraine, then use of analgesics, antiemetics, and second line treatment with triptans, prophylaxis, ciproheptadine, propranolol may be uh, useful. Then the role of certain medications like smooth muscle relaxants or antispasmodics. Now, anticholinergics that we use daily, uh, uh, dicyclomines, are used empirically but are often unhelpful in the absence of any specific indication. Other smooth muscle relaxants like Drotraverine, these are uh, phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitors, antispasmodic intestinal smooth muscle relaxants without any anticholinergic side effects. These, the use of these drugs are debatable and are, like I said, are often unhelpful in absence of specific indications. Use of probiotics or symbiotics also debatable. Then uh, often we use specific medications uh, for treating specific symptoms in recurrent in functional abdominal pain, like pain that can be managed with antispasmodic agents. We use tri, uh, antispasmodics and tricyclic antidepressants. Diarrhea that may be managed with lopramide antibiotics or 5 h 3 antagonist. Constipation with the uh, medication, like I said. But in all medication trials, there is often a high response to placebo. That indicates that um, there is no major role for these medications. And this is actually used as an adjuvant to cognitive behavior therapies. So uh, that was briefly about uh, recurrent abdominal pain, how to go about approaching recurrent abdominal pain in children. And to conclude, recurrent abdominal pain is most often considered functional abdominal pain, but an organic cause is found in 5 to 10 percent that we have to keep in mind. Functional abdominal pain is a clinical diagnosis and therefore does not require many diagnostic workup. So if the history and physical examination is unremarkable and there are no alarming signs and symptoms, a few basic investigations may only be needed in such cases. And uh, understand and make the parents understand the uh, condition of the child. And further workup should be reserved for children with alarming symptoms and signs only. And the most important component of treatment of functional gastrointestinal disorders, reassurance and education of the child and family. Thank you. Now, uh, if uh, anybody having any doubt, uh, please feel free to ask.